that you may come back to it later if you need and so others who may have missed out on today's event will be able to come and watch it. Thank you for joining. So now at this time, please mute your mics for best sound experience. Otherwise, the feedback could interfere with the information we will be sharing today. Without further ado, here is Mr. Carizales. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. I, and I also hope all of you had a, a good and safe spring break. I'm sure um, all of you needed a good, well-deserved break. Um, so today's um, Friday Happy Math Hour, we're going to be dealing with exponential and logarithmic functions, okay? So please... Um, Ruben, yes, I'm Dad. sorry to interrupt. Um, have we already separated separating the people? Oh, so if um, you are here to um, view Math 1314, please stay here. If you are here to review Math 1324, please uh, click on the link for the um, 1324 that's on your chat. So let's give a couple of seconds so we can give students to um, transfer to the next room. Okay, <clears throat> so I, I also encourage you, if you have any questions, um, please put them on the chat um, and, and ask us. Um, also, I'm, I'm going to give you a little riddle right now, um, and um, I hope that you all could um, indulge me in, and participate in it, okay? So let's go ahead and, and get started. Um, so today's um, session, again, is on exponential and logarithmic functions. Okay. <clears throat> so we'll start first with the definition of an exponential function. An exponential function, f, um, has a base. Um, and in, in this example or in this definition, the base is signified as a. And its exponent, um, here with the variable x, um, is again called its exponent. Now, um, a at the base cannot be zero because uh, <clears throat> um, anything to the um, zero base is just going to be zero, and anything to uh, a base that is one is just always going to be one, no matter what the exponent is. Okay, so the domain for an exponential function is a set of all real numbers, and the range of and exponential functions, a set of all positive real numbers. And, and you'll be able to see this when we look at its graph, okay? So before we get started um, dealing with um, exponential and logarithmic functions, as, as I mentioned, I have this riddle. Now, this, this riddle, this is just a riddle. This is a hypothetical situation. I'm not going to give out pennies, and, and I'm not going to give you a lump sum of one million dollars okay but um let's say i have this situation where where um, someone is asking you this what option would you choose and the first option is this suppose that you would receive a penny on a first day of class and then two pennies on the second day of class four pennies on the third day of class eight pennies on the fourth day of class and so on and so forth and and your teacher would would continue doing this until the 31st day Okay, um, that would be one option uh, to take um, pennies every day, right? And, and as you can see, we're, we're doubling your pennies every day that goes by. Would you prefer this option or would you prefer just to have $1 million up front? Which option would you choose? Anyone? So I see um, Ms. Chuka put you know, flying money, right? <laughs> money is money. So, but which one would you prefer, Jason? Would you prefer having pennies every day or would you prefer a million dollars?
pennies. Okay, Alan says pennies. Okay, all right. Well, let's see. Let's let's see. Um, 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 so Jason here has chose his one uh, one million dollars. Okay, let's see um, what will result if uh, if we chose the penny option. Yes. So <clears throat> again, if, if we were completing a table for the pennies, again, this is the situation that we have. Okay, the first day um, um, you have um, one penny, but then after that, we're going to be doubling your pennies. Okay. And one of the things, the reason why I'm using this river is, as you can see, is I have an exponent situation going on. My base on this um, exponent is two, and then my exponent is one, my base again is two, my exponent is two, and so on and so forth. So if I were to do this um, and find out what, how much amount of money I have on the 31st day, okay, um, to answer this, again, because the first day we were just getting the penny, so we are not, we don't include the exponent for that first day. So that's why we're going to do the exponent 2 to the 30th power. So when I do 2 to the 30th power, what I get is, you know, like 1 billion pennies. But again, um, these are pennies. We need to move um, the decimal two places over, right, because there's 100 pennies uh, in $1. So the amount that we would get is um over 10 million dollars okay so for those of you who who wanted the penny option you're gonna get a lot more money than than the 10 million dollars right so the reason why i like to give this riddle or this presentation is that um exponential functions are very very important and they're important because they grow really really fast and another reason why i wanted to show this this um, riddle for you is when you're answering problems on your homework, it's very, very crucial that, that when you are putting in your numbers and putting in decimal values to calculate an exponential function, um, missing one decimal can create a big jump in the amount, as you can see in this money. You know, we're looking at 31 days, and from one day to the next, you can have over a million dollars. So be very, very careful when dealing with exponential functions again <clears throat> um i wouldn't mind having either of the two options right like yvette had said in the chat but again this was just hypothetical all right now um this situation that our uh, this riddle that i just uh presented to you is basically uh, the parent function of the exponential functions that we're going to be dealing with okay um and this is the model f of x is equal to 2 to the x, again, where my base of this exponential function is 2, and my input or the exponent is my variable x, okay? All right, so <clears throat> keep in mind that when dealing with exponential functions, your exponent, the x value, is a real number and can be replaced also with irrational numbers, okay? Um, but when we're dealing with these problems here, we're just going to use real numbers, okay? All right, so if I do a table of values for this function, f of x is equal to 2x, okay? And I'm gonna just randomly pick these values from negative four all the way to two, okay? What you see is this graph. And again, it's the definition of the exponential function. My domain for my exponential function is all real numbers, okay? This graph is gonna go forever to the left and it's gonna go forever to the right, okay? Um, my, my range, as you can see, is all uh, positive real numbers. All this graph is above the x-axis. Okay, it's it's going to come close, close to this x-axis. Never going to touch it, but it's going to go forever up. Okay. All right. So these are the basic properties of my exponential function or my graph. Okay, the graph will pass through this points is which is my y-intercept zero one okay all graphs are continuous curves again there are no holes and as i mentioned to you the graph will go forever to the left and go forever to the right okay the x-axis as i mentioned to you of uh, the graph does um does the graph does not cross the x-axis so our x-axis is considered 
a horizontal asymptote. And we've covered asymptotes before. These are these imaginary lines that a graph does not touch. Like it gets very, very close to, to this um, imaginary horizontal line, but it doesn't touch it or cross it. Okay, so our exponential functions have a horizontal asymptote, and it's on our parent function, it's this x axis. Okay, so if a is a positive value greater than one, then it is increasing. If a is um, larger than zero but smaller than one, then my exponential function is decreasing. Okay, keep these in mind. These are our basic properties, and we'll we'll see this um, later on. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so again, just to um, summarize the basic characteristics, looking at our graph again. The domain in interval notation is from negative infinity to positive infinity. Our range is from zero to positive infinity again, and we put a parenthesis here because we're not including zero. Okay, this is our interval notation. Our y-intercept is zero one. Again, our graph is increasing. When we're reading graphs, um, we just read graphs like the just the way you read um, your math book, right? We read from left to right, and we see that our graph from left to right is increasing, okay? Again, our x-axis is our horizontal asymptote, and this graph is continuous. There are no gaps and no holes in our graph, okay? All right, so here is an example of um, an exponential function where it is a fraction, but could it also be displayed, and, and this is by using our exponent rules, two to the negative x, okay? Two to the negative x, okay? If I use my exponent rules, I can rewrite this as one over two x, yes? So you can see that the domain for this graph is from negative infinity to positive infinity is still um, the same, the, the domain does not change, and my range does not change either, it's all positive real numbers, okay? Uh, also, something that doesn't change, your my y-intercept, my y-intercept still 0, 1, okay? Now, this graph is decreasing. Again, we read graphs from left to right, and if you see, this graph is going down, down, down. It's going to get close to my x-axis, but it's never going to touch it or cross it because my x-axis is my horizontal asymptote. And again, this graph is continuous. There are no breaks or gaps, okay? So our exponential functions, all of them, it doesn't matter what we're graphing, they're always going to be increasing or always going to be decreasing, okay? All right, so let's just change it up a bit. Let's change the base on an exponential function, and let's, let's look at this one f of x is equal to um, base 3 to our exponent x, to our input, okay? So again, if we construct a value of points, okay, um, we're going to see that this graph is just like the one before, okay? It is, it is increasing. We're looking at from left to right, okay? And it has the same shape. It's this curve that skyrockets up. And again, this is one of the very things that are very dangerous with exponential functions because they grow very rapidly. As you can see, pennies can, can grow really, really fast, okay? All right. So, again, this um, graph has a vertical, uh, horizontal asymptote, excuse me, as the x-axis, okay? All right. So, let's look at another example. This graph, f of x, is equal to 4 to the negative x, okay? So compared to the one that we had seen, 4 to the x, is, it's a reflection of the graph, right? So it's, it's the opposite, okay? So this one is decreasing. We read our graph from left to right, okay? Um, this graph is decreasing. It's going to get closer and closer to, to my x-axis, but it's never going to touch it. And just as before, it's going to have a y-intercept of zero, one, okay? All right, so 
let's look at some properties of exponential functions, okay? And these are our exponent laws. They refer to our exponent laws. So when you have two numbers that have the same base, okay, you're going to add ex exponents, okay? Similarly, and or opposite to multiplication is division, okay? If we are dividing two numbers that have the same base, we will be subtracting the exponents, okay? And then we have what's called the power rule. When we have a base to some exponent and we take it to another exponent, we're going to multiply the exponents, okay? So in this case, our, our first exponent was a, x, excuse me, and we're gonna take it to the exponent y. It's gonna be the product of x times y, okay? Now, similarly here, if we have two elements that are being, or two numbers that are being multiplied and taken to an exponent, we can separate these. This is the same thing as the product of a to the x times b to the x, okay? Similarly with the quotient of two numbers. If I'm dividing two numbers, a divided by b, and I'm taking the whole quotient to an exponent, I can simplify that by taking just a to the x divided by b to the x, okay? And just as before as our definition, x cannot be, it cannot equal zero because as you all know, anything to the zero exponent is just gonna give us one all the time. It doesn't matter what the base is, anything to the, exponent of zero, the answer will always be one, okay? And then we have this other property, which is gonna be very, very handy, and we're, I'm gonna talk about it right now because you're gonna see it a lot in, in some of your homework problems, is this, that if I have a, an exponent equal to another exponent, the only way these two exponents uh, numbers can be equal is if A and B are the same, if they have the same base. Okay, uh, similarly, if I have two numbers that are the same, for these two numbers to be the same, that means that the exponents also have to be the same. The only way that these two numbers can be the same is if the exponents are also the same, okay? Now, this property has a special name, okay? This property is called the one-to-one -one property, okay? Now, to understand this one-to-one -one property, um, we have to look at the graph having um, a one-to-one -one relationship to our equation. And, and this is simply by saying that A has to be greater than zero, A cannot equal one. And if this is the case, if I have two numbers that have the same base, the, for this to be true, is that their exponents all have to be equal, okay? Any questions? All right, let's look at some examples that where we can use our one-to-one -one property. So if you look at this equation and, and you're gonna have a homework problem that says, solve the given equation for x. And one thing that, that you should look, that you should see right away is that both the left side um, equation, um, number on the equation, and on the right, they both have the same base. Both of them have a base of 10. So this says that because these both numbers have the same base, that for these two, for this two numbers to be the same, that means that our exponents also have to be the same. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite um, my exponents. This is telling me that 2 minus 4x has to equal to 6x minus 1. For this equation to be true, my exponents also have to be equal to each other. So we're going to do a little bit of algebra to solve for x. Now, it doesn't matter how you solve for x. Um, by convention, I always like to move my x on the left and have the numbers or they equal to numbers to the right, okay? So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna subtract 6x on both sides, and I'm gonna subtract two on both sides, okay? So when I do this, um, minus uh, two minus two is gonna give me zero, minus four x 
minus 6x is a minus 10x. On the right side of the equation, 6x minus 6x is 0. Minus 1 minus 2 is minus 3. Okay? Then all I need to do in opposite of multiplying by a negative 10 is dividing by a negative 10 on both sides. So I'm going to divide by a negative 10 on both sides. And a negative divided by a negative is going to give me a positive. So x is equal to 3 over 10. So that is my answer. The value for x is 3 over 10. And the property that I used was the 1 to 1 property to solve this exponential equation. Okay. All right. So let's try it again. Um, now, if you see on this one, we can still use our 1 to 1 property. We'll just have to do a little bit of, of simplifying. So one of the things that I notice is that I have a um, an exponential function on the left side of this equation, which is 4, uh, that has a base 4, to an exponent of x plus 1. But I have a number on the right side. But I can create a number with an exponent that has a base of 4 as well. Okay? Now, so let's rewrite the equation that has the, the same base on both sides. Okay? All right. So, again... I did this really quickly, but let me show you uh, a good technique. For instance, for those of you who, who don't see that, that 64 is the same thing as 4 cubed, what I like to do is something that's called a um, binary tree or a factor tree. And I have 64 here. And what I say to myself, okay, um, this 64, I want to convert it into something that has a base of 4. So what I'll do is I'm going to divide this 64 by 4 by creating this um, um, factor to your prime factorization, uh, factorization tree. Hopefully, um, or maybe some of you guys might remember, they taught you how to do this back in high school, which might have been a long time ago for some of us, right? So what I do is I'll divide 4 into 64. So I say 4 goes into 6 one time, um, um, remainder um, 2, okay? And then... 4 will go into 24 six times, okay? So then now I have 4 as one of my values, and so then I'm going to do it again. I'm going to divide 16 by 4. Well, 4 will divide into 16 um, four times, okay? So 64, the building blocks of 64 are all these leaves from my tree, 4 times 4 times 4. So this can be written as 4 times 4 times 4. So how many 4s do I have? I have 3. So 4 cubed will give me 64. Okay? All right. So anyway, this is just to help you. Um, and, it's, and this can be very helpful when they give you very large numbers. This one was um, small and easy to do, but sometimes you'll get very large numbers, and this is a quick and... I'm safe way to find the true base, okay? All right, so I'm gonna apply my one-to-one -one property. Then my one-to-one -one property says that when I have two numbers that have the same base, the exponents have to equal to each other as well, okay? So then this is telling me that x plus one should equal three. And again, I'm gonna use algebra now to solve for x. I'm gonna subtract one on both sides, okay? And when I do that, um, it's going to give me x equals 2. Okay. Any questions? Okay, let's move on. All right, let's, let's look at this one. Okay, let's continue solving. And what I want to do is um, I want to continue practicing because my one-to-one -one property is very, very useful. So if I see here, I have on the left side of my equation, I have an exponent with a base 5, and the exponent is x minus 3. But on the right side, I have this fraction. Okay? Again, I can do my binary tree again for the 125. And what I'll do is I'm going to divide the 125 by 5. And again, and it's going to show me that I have 1 over 5 cubed. But using my properties of exponents, I'm going to move it 
uh, above instead of it being a denominator. So a positive three, if I move it to the top, it's going to become a negative three. So now every in my um, equation with both sides of the equation with a base five, and again, for my one-to-one -one property states that for this to be true, my exponents also have to equal to each other, okay? So I will rewrite it. X minus three is equal to negative three. Then all I have to do is add three on both sides. Um, so X is equal to zero, okay? All right, any questions? Okay, let's continue moving. All right, let's let's solve for this one again. I I want to continue using um, my one to one property. So what I'm going to do is I'm I'm going to give you a few seconds to for you to start it on your own, um, and then we'll compare answers. Also, um, at the end of this presentation, um, I'm going there's going to be a link provided to you. Where, where you're going to do a survey and you're going to have to answer the, you're going to have to input the answer for this question, okay? Ruben. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to say, um, don't worry about putting the answer at the end of the survey. It's only going to be for people who are watching the video, let's say tomorrow, for example. But since you, oh, guys, okay. are, since you guys are in here um, going over this with us, you don't have to... You'll, you'll just skip that question if you want to at the survey. Okay. All right, so, all right, so I see some, some of you all are giving me answers already. So let me, let's go ahead and, and solve for this, okay? So um, I'm gonna use my one-to-one -one property. So what I have on the left side is two to the X plus six and what I'm going to do is going to convert 8 to 2 cubed, right? 2 times 2 is 4. 4 times 2 is 8, okay? So now I can see that both of my problems have the same base. They have a base of 2. So using my one-to-one -one property says that for these two numbers to be the same, my exponents also have to be the same. So we have x plus 6 is equal to 3, okay? To solve for x, I'm going to subtract 6 on both sides. So x is equal to negative 3. Okay, excellent, guys. Very good job. All right, any questions? All right, good job. All right, so let's move on. So <clears throat> we also, we're going to be dealing with um, exponents with a base e. Now, base e just like our pi, pi uh, our pi symbol represents a number and it's an irrational number, so is our e. Our e is a symbol that represents an irrational number and this is a number that goes on forever, okay? It, 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 it never ends and, and these are just a few numbers. e is roughly 2.718281828 and it goes on forever, okay? Now, this base um, e exponent, uh, exponential function, excuse me, it's called your natural exponential function. And believe it or not, the graph of this exponential function is the same one that we were dealing with. F of X is equal to two to the X. It's going to produce the same graph. Okay. It's this identical one. Okay. Where it's um, my domain for the graph is from negative infinity to positive infinity. It's all real numbers. The range is from zero to infinity or all positive real numbers. Okay, and it's the exact same identical graph. It's gonna cross the y-axis at zero, one. Okay, and, and um, we use the natural exponential function for a lot of um, application problems, which we'll probably see later on in this chapter, okay? All right, so just to to show you some of the graphs, okay? Um, y e to the x, okay, is the graph that I was mentioning to you that is very similar to our f of x is equal to two to the x, is this one in blue, okay? When we have it to the negative x, we create a reflection on the y-axis, and it's 
um, it goes from an increasing function to a decreasing function, okay? So the domain again is from negative infinity to positive infinity. Our range is from zero to infinity, okay? We have a horizontal asymptote at um, our x-axis, okay? At x equals zero is our horizontal asymptote, okay? All right, so let's use our one-to-one -one property to solve um, this um, natural um, exponential function, okay? So if the first thing you should all notice is that on this equation, both sides have the same base. I have a base E on the left, and I have a base E on the right, okay? So by my one-to-one -one property says that for this two numbers to be the same, this is telling me that the exponents also have to be the same. So I'm going to apply my one-to-one -one property and set my exponents equal to each other. This is saying that x squared minus 3 equals to 2x, okay? All right, so again, I am going to move everything to one side of the equation because if you notice, um, we, have what's, um, we have a square value on, on the left side. So this means that we're going to be solving for a quadratic equation, okay? So when I do this, when I move my 2x to the left, okay, I have x squared minus 2x minus 3 is equal to 0. So there's going to be several ways you can solve for this quadratic equation. And again, we you've seen um, us solve um, using a factoring. You could also use the quadratic formula to solve for, for this problem, okay? So in, in, in my case, I always like factoring a lot better. Uh, the quadratic is nice and I love it. Um, it's beautiful, but I think it's kind of long. But so I love factoring. That's always my first um, option to factor. So when I factor this x squared minus 2x minus 3, I can factor this as x minus 3 times x plus 1, okay? So from my rules for anything that is equal to 0, either this is equal to 0 or this is equal to 0. So I'll separate it. Um, x minus 3 is equal to 0 or x plus 1 is equal to 0. That's the only way that a product of two numbers will be equal to 0. So when I solve for x, x is equal to 3 and x is equal to negative 1, okay? So again, don't be scared on your natural exponents. You handle them the same way, okay? Any questions? Okay, all right. So let's move on to a very, very popular um, exponential equation um, and formula, okay? And this is one's called the compound interest. So if any of you out there have ever um, purchased a car or has a bank account, believe it or not, this is the equation that they use in order to either calculate your payments on your car or to calculate um, the interest and money that they're gonna give you every month from your bank account, okay? So um, let, I want to give a little explanation of this compound interest formula. And again, it's we're dealing with it because, again, as you see, it has an exponent factor in it, this nt. And, and, I'll, and I'll explain it in detail, okay? So first, for me, um, the a, I always like to consider the this value from this equation as the future value. This is that when I when I give it some information on the right, it's going to give me the value at the end, okay? P, the variable P, um, is your initial amount, and, and in the business, it's called the principal. But I, I like to consider the P as the, 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 the present value, and I, I have a typo there. It's not supposed to be the future value. It's supposed to be my present value, okay? Um, R is the annual interest rate, okay? And we're going, when we're using the formula, we're going to represent this as a decimal. In your homework and in your book, they're always going to give you the interest rate as a percentage, okay? So 
Don't forget to always move the decimal two places to the left um, to represent it as a decimal, just like my money problem. When, when I had my, my pennies, okay, I wanted to think of it as in dollars. So I had to move my, my decimal over, okay? Also, the, the, the T is going to represent the number of years, okay, or, or T represent years, and N is going to correspond to the compounding term. Now, there's going to be several compounding terms, okay? Um, and when you're doing your homework, and if you ever have word problems, whenever they say that you are going to use a compounding formula and the, the compounding term is taken semi-annually, that means it's going to be twice a year or N is equal to 2. When a problem tells you that they're going to take the, the compounding formula quarterly, that means that N is going to be equal to 4 or 4 times a year. Whenever they say that the compounding formula is going to be taken monthly, okay, that means N is equal to 12. And when they say that the compounding formula is done daily, you're going to use the value of 365. Okay, n is equal to 365. All right, now, so these are the interest rates per annual. So again, these rates have to be divided by um, their interest, okay? So let's look at this problem. Find the amount to which $1,500 will grow if deposited in a bank at 5.75% interest compounded quarterly for five years, okay? So reading this problem, what they want us to know is after we deposit this $1,500, what's going to be our future amount, right? So, so the variable that we're looking to solve for here is A. We want our future amount. And this $1,500, this is our, our initial value, our present value. So it's going to be our value for P, okay? The 5.75 interest, that's the R in percentage, right? So we're going to move it into a decimal. Now here, quarterly, this quarterly, oh, I know that the compound term for this N is going to be equal to four. And it want me to do it for five years, so T is equal to five. So I'm going to write down what they gave me. So my solution, to solve for, for my future value is substituting P for 1,500. R in a decimal representation is 0 0.0575. Again, N is equal to four because they said quarterly and T is equal to five. Okay, so I'm going to um, plug these values into my um, compound interest formula. Okay, so when I do this, okay, um, I'm gonna follow these steps. Now, I, I gave you the answer right away, but, but again, be very, very careful when doing these exponential functions. So the first thing that I would do is I, on my calculator, I would do the division of zero, uh, 0 0.0575 divided by four, okay? Then I'm gonna add one to that value, okay? And then once I have that answer, I'm gonna take it to the exponent of four times five, which is, um, 20, so this number to the 20th power, and then I'm going to multiply by 1,500, okay? Now, we're dealing with money, but you're, in your homework, they're going to tell you to round your answer to two decimal places, okay? So, so the answer for this is going to be $1,995.55, okay? Always don't forget, um, when we're dealing with a compound interest, we're dealing with money. So we're always, always going to round to cents, unless they tell you just to round to the nearest whole number, okay? All right, now, always, uh, as mentioned by that, do not round until the end. You don't wanna round your answers as you go. Like I mentioned to you, rounding by a, by a penny is going to create a big difference in your final amount. So you never wanna round as you go, you always want to round your answers at the end, okay? Exponents, exponential functions are very dangerous because they grow really, really fast, so you don't want to cut any numbers out, okay? All right. 
So let's do another example. Let's look at another finance problem. Okay, so a couple just had a baby um, and they want to invest in the bank um, $35,000. Uh, or excuse me, they want to invest some money in the bank so that they can have $35,000 at the end. And, and what they want is, is they want um, when, when their child turns 18 and gets ready to go to college, they, they're able to give them money to, to go to college, right? So the parents want to prepare and their bank is going to um, apply the interest daily, right? So we're going to say that um, our compounding term n is going to be 365 yes so what they're giving me here is the rate which is 5.8 okay um they're giving me the future value so this is the um variable for a yes um the 18 years is the time which is going to be for t t is equal to 18 so what i'm trying to solve for this problem is p my present value okay all right so that's what I don't know. I don't know what P is. So let's go ahead and use our compounding interest formula to solve for what P is. Again, these are my variables. A is 35,000. My R in as a decimal representation is 0 0.575. Um, oops, that's another typo. It should be 58. Okay, I think my answers should be correct. Um, N is 365 and T is equal to 18. Okay, all right, yes, I did correct it at the, uh, in my next slide. All right, so um, again, I'm going to solve for this problem and, and I'm gonna show you a little bit more steps on this one because this one's a little bit not too straightforward to solving for P, okay? So those steps that I would take in order to solve for this one, again, I would first do the division inside, just like before, the 0, 5, 8, divided by 365 is going to give me this number. I'm not going to round it. I wrote all the numbers that that my calculator showed me. Again, you never want to round this 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 number. Again, it could be detrimental. You can be off. And again, you're also doing computer work. The computer is very, very picky. It's very exact. You're off by a, a penny. It's going to mark it wrong. Okay? And then I do my multiplication, 365 times 18. It's going to give me 6570. Okay, then I'm going to still continue with inside my parentheses. I'm going to add one to that value of 0 0.00158904. Gives me 1.00015890. Okay, then the next thing is I'm going to take this number to the 6570 power. Okay, and it's going to give me this value. Um, 2.8403209.63. Again, I don't want, don't want to round. Um, I want to use all the numbers that my calculator gives me. Okay, at the rounding you always want to do at the end. Okay, so to solve for p, I'm going to divide this number um, on both sides, and it's going to give me p is equal to 35,000 divided by 2.8403209.63. Okay, and then my answer, again, because I'm dealing with money, and the, and, and the computer's going to tell you, round your answer to two decimal places, okay? Um, again, because we're dealing with money. So my answer is $12,322.55. The rounding won't come until the end. Please do not round as you go. Um, changing a penny is going to give you a big difference of a number, okay? Any questions so far? All right, let's move on, okay? <clears throat> what is CRM? Oh. Um, so the for the applications, again, you have a compound interest um, formula and you also have um, a formula that's called the continuous compound interest formula. And as you can see, this one is going to use the base E for, um, for problems, okay? So whenever in your homework they ask you to, to solve for a future value using a continuous, you're going to use this formula. A is equal to the um, present value um, times E to the RT, okay? 
All right, so let's go ahead and now look at the logarithmic functions, okay? Um, the logarithmic functions, I, what I like to think of logs is the opposite of an exponential function or the inverse, okay? The, the math term that we're going to be looking at is called the inverse function. Um, so in order to get you um, to understand more logarithmic functions, let's talk about this um, term inverse, okay? So first of all, for a function to have an inverse, it has to be one to one, okay? This means that the range values correspond to exactly one domain value, okay? So if you remember from functions, a function uh, was a function if every um, domain represented one range value. So the opposite of that is that every range value corresponds to exactly one domain value, yes? So if you remember, to find out if a graph was a function, you did the vertical line test. So to check to see if a function has an inverse, you're going to do the um, horizontal line test, okay? So the horizontal line test will check to see if the graph has an inverse or if it's one to one, okay? All right, so let me ask you, which of these two graphs is one to one, meaning it has an inverse? A or B? Okay, so if we see here, if, if we're doing a horizontal line to the B1, okay, and if we do an imaginary horizontal line, we're going to cross our graph on two places, right? You know, if we do a line here, we cross our graph in two places, right? So if we do a horizontal line on this one, oops, if I were just too straight, we don't cross it, right, twice, okay? All right, so um, for a function to be one to one means that it has an inverse, okay? And it's gonna pass this horizontal line test. If the graph does not pass this horizontal line test, then it means that it does not have an inverse, okay? All right, so if I was looking back at my exponential function, y equals two to the x, okay? Again, we have this um, continuous graph that is increasing, okay? So the inverse of this would be to swap my, my, my inputs. Uh, as you can see that for an exponential function, I am taking an input to the x and my output is to the y. Opposite to that would be doing the opposite, that my y is my input for an exponential function and my output is the x value, okay? So this, this representation of swapping my, my input values is to find the inverse of a graph, okay? So this representation of x is equal to 2y, we're going to write it with this word, L-O-G, meaning log or logarithmic. Now, as you can see, the base of this log is two, just the same way as the base of my exponent was two, okay? Um, my input for my exponent was x. It's still my input here for my log. And then my output for the y is still y, yes? But when I write it as an exponent, they're swapped, okay? They're backwards, All right? So, Let's go ahead and look at some paired values. So you can see how opposite they are. And I'm still gonna be using my parent function. Y is equal to two X and the X is equal to two Y. Do you see that when my input is negative three for my exponential function, that is the same as my output for my logarithmic function. When my input for my exponential function is negative two, it is my output 
for my logarithmic function. So they are opposites of each other, okay? These two equations are the same, but when we are written as an exponent and as a log, they are opposites of each other. Okay? And we'll see this with examples because I'm running out of time, okay? So the, the graph of this exponential logarithmic function together, okay, as you can see, they have um, this symmetry in refers to this y equals x line. This dotted line is the symmetric. They're, they're opposites of each other. The exponential function here has a, uh, is increasing from left to right, and it has a horizontal asymptote at, it x, at the x-axis. It's crossing um, the y-axis, or it has a y-intercept at 0, 1. Now let's look at the opposite, okay? Uh, my log function, the log function is also increasing from left to right, but if you see, opposite to a, vert a horizontal line is a vertical line. So my log has a vertical asymptote at the y-axis, okay? Opposite to a y-intercept is an x-intercept. My log has an x-intercept at one, zero, okay? Um, and again, both of these graphs are continuous. Um, there are no gaps in this uh, on the graphs, okay? Any questions? All right, let's move on. So um, again, this is to show you the, the, the differences between the two, two graphs, okay? They're opposites. The domain of the exponential function is from negative infinity to positive infinity. That means that that's the range for the log function, okay? Which is from, oops, the, um, no, no, this is correct. Um, from infinity to negative infinity. No, no, they're, they're supposed to be swapped. It's supposed to be from negative infinity to positive infinity. Sorry. Um, and then my range is from my exponential function is from zero to infinity. So opposite to the range is the domain. So the domain is from zero to infinity, okay? The exponential function has a y-intercept at zero, one. My log has an x-intercept at one, zero, okay? It has a, my exponential function has a horizontal asymptote at the x-axis. My log function has a vertical asymptote at the y-axis, okay? All right, so um, and I explained to this, so let's go ahead and move forward. So um, the logs also have a natural log, just ha just like how the exponential functions have a natural um, exponent. The logs have an uh, also a natural log, and they're indicated by the ln. Now, for the natural log button on your calculator corresponds to the base 10 log, okay? Because in Y10, we have 10 numbers or 10 digits to count in, um, in our counting system, right? So that's why it's base 10. So when you're using your calculator, it's very important that if they give you a base 10 log or um, to solve for, you can use your calculator. If you don't have a base 10 a log, problem, again, you want to use your one-to-one -one properties to solve for x, okay? All right. So let's go ahead and practice converting from log to exponent, okay? So what I want to do is I want to write this logarithmic equation in exponent form, and I want to do it vice versa. So the first thing that I've noticed is that this log has a base of four, my input is 16 and my output is x, right? So remember, if I'm going to write it as an exponential function, it's the opposite. So what I'm going to do is I'm still going to have a base of 4, okay, for my exponent. But now what was my output before now becomes my input. My input is now the x. And what was my input before is going to become now my output for my exponential function. So. Again, the base will be the same. Again, keep in mind that when we're converting, we have to have the same base. For these two to be the same, we have to have the same base for them to be equal, okay? All right, let's look at some more examples, okay? If I have 125 is equal to 
five cubed. I want to convert this um, exponential function into a log. So I'm going to have a log that has a base five. Now again, my input for the exponent was three, so for my log is going to become my output. I have an output of 125 for this exponent, so it's going to be my input. So when I write it, I have a log of base five. Okay, so the the base is the same. Okay, again, the three was my input. Now it becomes my output. The 125 used to be my output. Now it's going to be my input. Okay. All right, let's look at this one. Okay, I, another log converted into an exponent. Um, again, this one, they don't give me a, a particular base, but it's a base B. But I'm going to follow it the same way. This has a base B. My exponent has to have a B. The output of this log becomes my input for my exponent. The input of my log becomes my output of my exponent. Okay? All right, and let's do this one really quick. Again, um, they didn't give me an exponent, but yes, they did. The left side here, the square root of 81, the square root symbol can be represented as an exponent, okay? So the square root of 81 can be represented as 81 to the 1 half, okay? The square root um, symbol can be represented as an exponent, okay? So now that I have that, I can rewrite my exponent into a log, okay? So again, my base is 81. Um, my input for my exponent was 1 half, so that becomes the output for my log. The output for my exponent becomes my input of the log, okay? So my final, so square root of 81 to the 9th equals to 9 can be written as um, the log of base 81 to the input 9 equals one half, okay? Um, all right, so these are some common logarithmic function properties, okay, for the log of, uh, for logs. Again, the log button on your calculator is just, it's usually going to be um, shortened to LOG, okay? Um, and now I'm going to go ahead and skip through these because, again, I have three more minutes. I want to show you one example using our properties, okay? So, so if I wanted to solve this problem using my properties for logs, okay, um, as you can see that I have um, a quotient in here, a fraction in here. So what I can do is I can use my quotient rule of properties to, to help me solve for this, okay? So what I'm going to do is my quotient property says that I can solve for this by, well, actually I'm... I can solve it, use converting it to um, an exponent, right? I can I can say three to the what is going to give me one to the twenty-seven, okay? And we know that for these, if I wanted to use my one-to-one -one property, I can convert my twenty-seven to something that has a base, okay? So I can say three to the negative three is the same thing as one over twenty-seven. So using my one-to-one -one property for these equation to be true, the exponent on this also has to be negative three, yes? Now, I think I'm out of time. I have one minute, but um, does anybody have any questions? Now, the slides, even though I didn't finish, the, the, the video will have the, all of the presentation, so, so you all can look at it, but if you have any questions, please ask right now. Ruben, can you go to the slide where um, it has the, did you add the slide with the, the link for the survey? Yes, ma'am. Let me okay. go ahead and do that. Yeah. Go ahead and do it there. And then I'll send out um, the PowerPoint to you once you sign in. And if I'm able to, I'll record a small video on these last slides and send that to you as well. Okay. So let me just let Ruben go to that other slide for anybody that is going to watch the video after. Okay. For, for you that are attending the happy hour, um, when you fill out the survey, it does ask you to enter the answers to the two questions. You don't have to do that. Um, it's only for people who are going to watch this later.
So thank you so much. Um, we love having you here. Please, um, if you have any questions, um, don't be shy and ask us. There, there are tutors available if you want to stay um, and to go over more of the exponential logarithmic uh, functions. Um, so thank you again for, for giving us your time. Thank you, Mr. Carrizales. Thank you, Ms. Chuka, for your presentation today. I'm going to stop the recording now.